Ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad you've joined us today for MITRE's Fire Rescue Drone Summit. I'm Steve King, a senior manager here at MITRE. I'd just like to mention that um, uh, we will be recording this session. Um, that's to allow those who are unable to attend uh, this morning an opportunity to, uh, to participate a little later on. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to Yasri Barsoom, our Vice President of MITRE's Center for Securing the Homeland. Yasri? Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Fire Rescue Drone Summit. As Steve said, I'm Yasri Barsoom. I'm Vice President and Director for the Center for Securing the Homeland. As you know, MITRE is committed to solving problems for a safer world in support of the entire homeland security enterprise. Fire and Rescue Community is a critical stakeholder in the homeland security enterprise. They keep our community safe, respond to emergencies, and ensure the well being of local communities. As you know, the use of uncrewed aerial system has become pervasive, and that has opened new opportunities for innovation. These in innovative technologies uh, are used by first responders to keep our nation safe uh, during extreme weather events, wildfire, or targeted uh, violence events. As you know, we started this initiative earlier this year to explore the use of uncrewed systems for the first responders. And we held a similar summit a few months ago with law enforcement community. And we have seen the application of uncrewed aerial systems uh, with the law enforcement community. I'll give you just one example. In Chula Vista, California, the police department, that police department has been at the forefront of deploying uncrewed systems uh, as an augmentation to, to the mission. They launched their program back in 2018 and the Chula Vista Police Department drone as first responder, also known as DFR program, provides airborne support to public safety operations. It is safe, responsible, transparent manner to protect the public Preserve, preserve the peace and reduce response time and increase the overall quality of life. They use UAS to evaluate the resources needed, prepare proper tactical response and increase safety for the first responder and the public. A few member of the team who created the DFR are now working with industry and you'll get to hear from them later today on the industry panel. Similar innovation uh, for the fire and rescue uh, community is possible as we have seen it with the law enforcement side. We could do more to support uh, the fire and rescue community and advance these capabilities. So the purpose of today's event is really to bring the, the fire and rescue community, representatives from that community, industry representatives and the Department of Homeland Security to illuminate the needs of the fire and rescue teams and advance these solutions for uh, mission applications. As you know, serving in the public interest, MITRE is committed to driving forward the, the, the notion of whole of nation approach working along the fire and rescue uh, teams and industry. And with that, it's my absolute pleasure to kick off the program uh, with a fireside chat uh, with Congressman Michael Guest, moderated by our own Steve King. Over to you, Steve. Good morning to everyone. I'm Steve King. I'm a senior manager here at uh, the MITRE Corporation. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Congressman Michael Guest today, who's joining us for a, a fireside chat style keynote address, uh, and I really appreciate it. Just to give the audience a little bit of background, I wanted to mention uh, about you, Congressman. You were a district attorney for Madison and Rankin counties in Mississippi. You earned a record for fighting for Mississippi's families by prosecuting criminals. Uh, and you've taken that same spirit and determination to Washington, D.C. to fight for Mississippi in the United States Congress. Uh, you're now serving your second term and represents the the, the third district in Mississippi. Uh, relevant to today's discussion, you currently serve as a vice ranking member uh, of the Committee on Homeland Security, uh, where you're working to protect our entire nation from foreign threats, uh, which is something I want to ask you about in a couple of minutes. Um, but 
more recently, uh, you've authored the Unmanned Aerial Security Act, that's HR uh, 4682, for those who want to look it up. <laughs> um, so the issue of public safety use of drones is uh, clearly an area of interest to you, and it, it leads me to our first question uh, for you. So um, you introduced the bill in Congress, the, US, uh, the, the UAS Act, um, and that prohibits the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from operating or purchasing foreign-made drones. Yeah. Um, so why do you feel that this is an important issue? Well, you know, what, what we've seen over the last, you know, particularly several years, but uh, started out really over a decade ago, is uh, we're starting to see more unmanned aerial uh, air systems uh, used uh, particularly uh, by the Department of Homeland Security. We know that they're uh, now used a lot of times by local law enforcement, by first responders, search and rescue that, that you mentioned uh, for a number of purposes. Uh, that might be, uh, I think earlier we had a brief conversation about wildfires. Uh, we know that uh, we've used those when we've had natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes. We've, we've used those when we are looking for maybe uh, individuals uh, who have uh, become lost in wooded areas. Uh, and so there are, are such a, a large uh, number of possibilities for this new technology. Uh, but with any new technology, uh, there's always things that you want to be able to protect the information, protect the data. Uh, particularly as it relates to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this bill was specifically limited to, uh, to that agency, uh, but we know that over 75% of commercial drones uh, that are uh, sold here in the United States uh, are manufactured in China. Uh, we've seen reports uh, and we know that there exists the possibility for data to be stolen. Uh, so when the information is being transmitted actually from the drone to the user, uh, that there's the possibility of that drone to be uh, stolen, uh, uh, some, some uh, nefarious country, particularly in this case, China would have the opportunity to have access to that information. Uh, and also there would be the possibility of potentially uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, being able to take control of those drones uh, and uh, cause uh, those drones uh, to cash, crash or become inoperable. And so uh, that is particularly important uh, in the Homeland Security Department of Defense ramp. And so we thought that it was important for us as Congress to do everything that we could uh, to make sure that those communications are safe and that the devices that we're using, uh, that that information uh, is not being stolen, not being siphoned off by other countries. And so uh, that was the reason for introducing the legislation. Uh, it was bipartisan legislation. Uh, it came out of the House overwhelmingly with bipartisan support. Uh, that bill has now been sent to the Senate. Uh, and we're hopeful and optimistic that between now and the end of this Congress, the bill will pass the Senate uh, and hopefully make it onto the president's desk. Well, that's wonderful. And we've seen states um, uh, coming out with their own, uh, at, the, at the state level, similar legislation limiting the use of, of different drones for public safety um, to U.S. made uh, and U.S. manufactured drones as well. And I guess this sort of begs the question, your bill was very much uh, focused on the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, but what about local fire and rescue departments across the country? Should they also consider not using foreign uh, Most definitely, you know, and so while, while our uh, legislation was somewhat limited in scope, uh, and, and what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to penalize local uh, law enforcement search and rescue who, who may not be able to, to buy, you know, some some of the, 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 the lower price drones to still have access to that. But I think it's definitely uh, something uh, that we need to be looking at. Uh, and we are making a big push here in Washington, a big push in Congress to see that not only are the devices manufactured here, the drones themselves, but the components uh, that we're getting to, to put in these uh, unmanned aerial air systems, that those also are manufactured here domestically. Uh, uh, we've got a challenge ahead. Uh, we know that many of the components are manufactured overseas and those components then are often assembled here, uh, but we've got to do a better job of actually manufacturing the components. Uh, this has a, a homeland security implication, national security, you know, you're talking about the Department of Defense, uh, making sure that their drone fleet is safe. But I think we also want to protect our first responders, our law enforcement, our fire, our rescue, uh, to know that the drones that they're flying, that the information that they're receiving is going to its destination. And we do not have to worry about some foreign power uh, or, or some foreign government being able to intercept those transactions. That's terrific. Thank you. I I know that's a, a topic of conversation that will come up later in this summit, um, and it's certainly one that I, I hear about regularly when I go out and, and meet with first responders around the country on the topic of drones. 
Um, in fact, I recently had an opportunity to visit your alma mater, Mississippi State University, uh, which has, a, as I'm sure you know, a 70-year history in aviation research um, at RASPERT, the Flight Research Laboratory down there. And I, I see them continuing this tradition of research, development, testing, and evaluation of unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, so I was just curious if MSU is where your interest in this important topic of drones began, or is there a more recent impetus for the introduction of the UAS Act? Well, you know, I will tell you that, that, that I'm extremely proud of uh, what my alma mater, Mississippi State University, is, is doing on the, uh, the research uh, and development side. Uh, they are working uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, working with the Department of Defense uh, as we are looking to see what we can do to uh, make drones more efficient, more effective, more uh, to, to bring those uh, to bring the cost down. Uh, and uh, and also looking at we, what we can do to make sure, as we talked about earlier, that we're protecting those communications back and forth between the device uh, and the operator. Uh, Mississippi State is partnering with 25 other universities. They're actually the lead university. They're also at Mississippi State University is the center, the FAA Center of Excellence for uh, Unmanned Aerial Systems. Uh, and so those uh, two organizations are, are working very closely uh, with one another. And so I will tell you that I've had the opportunity to visit their facility, to see some of the things that they are doing, to talk to some of the people who are working there. Uh, and, and I'm extremely impressed uh, with what they are doing, not only now, but what they are talking about doing in the future. This is a developing technology. Uh, we see that drones are getting better, they're getting faster, they're getting cheaper each and every year. Uh, and so some of the things that we're going to be producing five, 10 years from now uh, are gonna make uh, our current drone fleet obsolete. Uh, and so we wanna make sure uh, that as we're doing that, uh, particularly we look in the home realm, uh, uh, the homeland defense realm, we're looking in the Department of, of Defense realm, what are we doing to make sure that we are supplying them with that next generation, uh, which is going to keep Americans safe? Uh, and we know that those next generation drones ultimately at some point are going to be used by, by law enforcement. They're gonna be used by, by fire and rescue. Uh, and so we're taking all those things uh, into consideration uh, in that development stage. Uh, but again, thank you for mentioning my alma mater, extremely proud of my Bulldogs and, and extremely proud of what they're doing at the Raspberry Flight Center. Well, I think all Mississippians should be proud of the work going on there. I was very impressed. Uh, it was a great opportunity to work with them. And you had mentioned the work, you know, the, you know, fire rescue, law enforcement, and others, and, and their use of, of drones uh, to respond to 911 calls. And um, so I, I, I'm going to ask sort of a, a, a delicate question here, uh, maybe an unpopular one, and that is that uh, you know, I, while the public safety benefits of, uh, you know, the use of drones for public safety is abundantly clear, how do we ensure community support from the people who are concerned about drones conducting surveillance against innocent people? Well, I, I do think that that's going to be a discussion we're going to continue to have, you know, balancing individuals' right to privacy uh, versus the benefit uh, that we know that uh, drone coverage provides. Uh, and so uh, a lot of that is going to be to make sure that the operators uh, of these devices are, are using that for its intended purposes. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, in the fire and, and rescue realm, uh, being able to have eyes in the sky, being able to have a drone which can cover large areas uh, is going to assist those individuals in finding whether it be a lost child or lost adult. Uh, we know that in the, the natural disasters, we can very quickly survey the damage. Uh, I think of cases uh, in which you have uh, large uh, events, uh, outdoor events such as sporting events, uh, particularly maybe high target uh, Major League Baseball, National Football, College Football, large gatherings of individuals. Uh, the use of unmanned aerial systems gives law enforcement that force multiplier. They're able to see a great, uh, the, the picture much clearer, uh, much broader uh, than just strictly having boots on the ground. Uh, and, I, and so I think if we continue to use this technology for its intended purpose, uh, that we're going to instill public trust into the uh, technology that we're using. Uh, and again, I see this as a former prosecutor, you know, I know of, of many of the advantages, you know, I think of law enforcement who may be going out and having to execute uh, a high risk search warrant, uh, being able to have eyes in the sky to make sure that they know where individuals are, they're going to protect those individuals who are uh, going to be executing those warrants. So there's so many advantages, uh, so many great things uh, that we're going to be able to use these devices for. 
and so we just got to make sure that we are not misusing this technology in any shape, form, or fashion because we want the public to have complete trust uh, in the technology that we're developing and using. Absolutely. That's terrific. And we certainly, you know, I'll go back a little bit. MITRE is a not-for-profit uh, chartered to work in the public interest. And we believe there's an important role for research and development in this area. But I'll, I'll turn it over to you and just ask, you know, what guidance would you offer to us or to the broader UAS drone, uh, the industry, the, you know, the, the for-profit commercial companies, uh, academia, fire rescue community, you know, the folks who are looking to use uh, drones in their daily operations, a any advice you might offer to us? Cause you're certainly well-versed in this, in this topic. Well, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for the role that, that, that y'all are playing uh, in this important field. Again, this is a, a developing field. This is a field that's going to have so many applications, you know, moving forward. You know, we talk about drones being used in this field for search and rescue for Department of Defense, Homeland Security. You know, I know that we've even talked uh, long term about places such as Amazon using drones maybe one day to deliver packages. And clearly we're not there yet. Uh, but those are the things uh, that we need to be looking uh, toward the future on. Uh, and so having you uh, having conferences where we're seeking the input of, of our first responders, uh, working with people like the Raspit Flight Center that you just talked about. Uh, so I think I, I'm a huge believer in private public partnerships. So when we have nonprofits, government agencies and private companies all working together, when we're able to pool resources together, uh, I think we're much stronger than when we take the go along attitude. And I think that that is where your group comes in and, and where they're so important. Uh, and so I'm very optimistic uh, about what the future holds for uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, I think that, that there are so many promising uh, fields ahead, uh, and I think we're just scratching the surface on this. Uh, and so we've seen the huge leap we've made in the last decade. You know, what is that leap going to look like in the decade to come? And y'all are going to be part of building that future. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and again, thank you for holding this important uh, conference and, and having these conversations. Well, Congressman, thank you very much for your time. I know how precious it is, and I certainly don't want to hold you a, a moment longer. And so I'll, I'll just uh, uh, wrap this up and and let the, the the audience get on to our panel of uh, fire chiefs and others that we've got, and just express my sincere thanks for your time and and your your interest in this topic. Uh, we really very much appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Congressman Guest uh, and Dr. King for that uh, presentation. We appreciate that, uh, Congressman Guest, your partnership, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Again, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Doral. I serve as the Chief Homeland Security Advisor at MITRE. And as you can see, we're very interested in working with our first responder community. Uh, and, and through the summit, we look forward to hearing from you, um, getting your input as we move forward in different initiatives that we have underway. At this time, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we have Fire Chief Dan Muncy, who has been with the San Bernardino Fire Protection District for over 25 years, rising from firefighter to paramedic to fire chief. Has a master's degree in public administration, holds the California State Training uh, Chief Officer Certificate, and is on the Technology Council Chairman for the International Fire Chiefs Association. Welcome, Chief. We also have United Kingdom Senior Fire Chief Dane Lane, now retired. He's hugely active in the first responder drone community and has been involved in various roles in the international realm. He's a board member for the Advanced Forest Fire Fighting Project and director of the Search and Rescue Academy. Welcome, sir. We have Mr. Vic Meisenheimer, who is the Emergency Management Coordinator for Caldwell County in North Carolina and has been in Caldwell Emergency uh, Services since 2018. He has a background that includes as a former Deputy Sheriff with the Caldwell County and Assistant Chief with the Sawmill Fire Rescue. Welcome. We have Battalion Chief Scott Roseberry, who has 20 years of experience with the Garland Hexton Fire Rescue. He has a bachelor's in emergency management and a master in public administration. Roseberry is a member of the International Associated Fire Chiefs Technology Committee, Department of Homeland Security First Responder Resource Group, and the FEMA Region 6 RAC. Welcome. And lastly, rounding out our panel, we have Mr. Richard Utanis, who is a public safety UAS subject matter expert, as well as a firefighter hazmat technician. 
with the Southern Manatee Fire Rescue located in Manatee County, Florida. In 2015, Rich took over the role as US, USA, US, UAS coordinator for the South Manatee Fire Rescue by creating the UAS program within his agency. Since then, his department has become a national leader in the developing and implementing policy and best practice for UAS response and hazardous materials and special operations. Again, everyone, welcome to our panel. I'd like to start with the first question. Uh, Chief Muncie, how are you using drones for firefighting Sorry. in your organization? Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I think there's five ways that we're doing it really. So the first would be, um, we're exploring the use of suppression drones. In other words, using retardant uh, ignition drones. Uh, we do have a full wildland camp. So our wildland crew is looking for safer ways to ignite um, fires to uh, combat the different situations we have. Monitoring and surveillance, obviously that includes mapping. Um, we're exploring a couple partnerships with some heavy lift drones for logistics. And finally, the fifth, I think, would be communications to ensure, as part of a mesh network, to ensure that we have communications in some of our comms denied environments. Thank you. Mr. Misenheimer, how are you using drones for firefighting? Again, thank you for uh, allowing me to join this panel, uh, mainly for situational awareness on, uh, on fire scenes, uh, so everybody can have a common operating picture. And... Uh, it's, it's monitoring extension on working structure fires and things of that nature. We've also uh, been recently in conversation with the North Carolina Forest Service. Uh, they do have a lot of manned aircraft, so obviously there ha has to be communication between uh, coordination with manned aircraft and, and unmanned aircraft, but mainly right now for uh, situational awareness on fire scenes. Thank you for that. Chief Roseberry, how about you? So we actually have an interesting uh, situation in Garland, and uh, and I'm I'm a good uh, person to reach out to on 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 drone systems because we've had two drones and we've crashed both of them. Uh, but the first one we actually we crashed it on a, on an actual swift water rescue. Um, so uh, we were using it mainly for situational awareness and swift water rescues. And uh, we in Garland we're an urban center, so we're right next to Dallas. And uh, we mainly have a, a lot of creeks that when, you know, we have like a lot of concrete. So when everything rains, it all floods downstream. So our creeks quickly rise. And then we have a lot of, about once a year, we have a swift water rescue. So we were using it mainly for that. But the idea was hazmat situational awareness on fires, uh, swift water rescues, uh, you name it. Thank you very much. Rich, Hulk Manatee. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And I apologize. Uh, they chose today to, to do the fire alarm testing here at our administrative office. So this, <laughs> you may hear that going off in the background, but um, uh, appreciate you having me on. Uh, so we've we've uh, done some some interesting things with drones, Speci specifically in the beginning, it was for a situational awareness type tool for our hazmat uh, calls. And then we realized that we could do a lot more with these systems and, you know, just kind of an eye in the sky mentality. So we started figuring out ways to use these systems to be more uh, part of the uh, mitigation process. So we do uh, remote metering, monitoring with drones, carrying rad detection, uh, flammable gas, chem detection with the, the aircraft itself to do a lot of the downrange uh, work, um, as well as we're interesting tactics with decon. And uh, we've done quite a bit of flammability testing to determine whether these, these systems could become uh, problems before the, you know, as opposed to solutions. So, um, a lot of interesting stuff happened down here in Manatee. Looks like it. Thank you for that. Chief Lane, we'll, we'll finish up the first round of questions with you. Again, how are you using drones for firefighting in the UK? Well, in the UK, and first of all, I should uh, thank you for asking me on here as well. Uh, over two thirds of fire and rescue services are now using drones in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. But I think it's true to say that, you know, listen to the other uh, presenters there, very similar sort of story, first of all, for situational awareness, then developing it into risk mitigation and so on. So uh, it, it's also, you know, relatively early days, I think, in the UK to perhaps um, how elsewhere has been developing. And I think that's a point that uh, Charles made earlier on, you know, that this is developmental. Thank you. And just a reminder to our attendees, uh, we, 
after each panel, we're going to have the opportunity for Q&A. So please uh, put your questions in the chat. So when we get to that part of the, uh, the uh, program that we can answer your questions. Chief Lane, I'm coming back to you for the next question. It's uh, why are international drone organizations like drone responders and emergency, international emergency drone organizations important? Well, I think picking up on the point that I made uh, just um, given that we're still a relatively small island mm -hmm. and um, it's useful to learn from other uh, countries. And so, you know, both the um, international drone organizations like Drone Responders and IEDO provide forums where lots of feedback can be obtained. And the other way as well, suppose you've got a project um, like one I recently put forward and ask for advice. You know, we, we need to be able to contact others, learn from others' experience and to fast forward it rather than make our own mistakes. Uh, we need to learn from others. And, you know, I appreciate really the work that in particular Charles has done and Wendelin Cleeks from France in organizing these uh, forums without which I think we'd be the much poorer. Good point. I, you know, I think we all can agree this, this is such an emerging area and the more forms we have like this summit, we exchange ideas, the better it will impact all, all first responders. So definitely agree with you. If you why are, what obstacles have you encountered when you're starting a drone program? I think you can share with our attendees as they start thinking about this area. I think obstacles are, are the key. What, what do you have to share with us? Uh, there's several. So first, internally, uh, our firefighters, the bright and shiny object, right? Um, when UAS has became a thing, the first thing that our organization did is went out and bought a lot of line assigned drones. Uh, of course, our pilots were firefighters, so we were essentially taking firefighters out of the fight. Um, that became a problem. The second obstacle, I think, that the biggest one we're facing in the industry right now is that the, the UAS capability um, and our pilots' abilities, our capabilities um, far outseed our authorization to utilize a lot of the platforms that we use through the FAA. And so we've been working with the FAA closely to make sure that um, we're looking for every avenue to create successful scenarios in which we'll be able to use UASs much more abundantly than we're doing today. We recognize clearly that UAS is part of an efficient response force early detection. Uh, early suppression, early mitigation, and um, being able to do that in a line of sight fashion is something we need to overcome. We need to truly get into BV loss in a, in a fashion that works for first responders. You know, I'm going to ask, you, that's a good point with the beyond visual line of sight. Do you have any examples? You know, where, where do you see the fire service going in this area? I, I'm going to ask a question in the future, but since we're talking about now, where do you see this going? Well, we serve a large county, largest county in the United States at 22,000 square miles. Mm -hmm. So for perspective, I think you can take small, the six, the six small states in the union, put it within our borders. Um, we're very spread out. Uh, so we have a very clustered metro area, but as you get out into our deserts, you literally could be three hours between stations. We need to have an overwatch ability, first off, to monitor our rail, our, our freeways, to be able to uh, then modify the response. We need to use the drones to have a quicker response capability. Um, for, for years, counties like mine have put millions and millions of dollars in their budgets for helicopters, and we, we look at the use cases for, for UASs and realize that we can replace that. Uh, we recognize that, you know, we need to have autonomous drones and semi-autonomous drones that are operating independent from human. As we, as we look at fires, fire suppression, for instance, when I first started 28 years ago, they told me that the metric that we were going to use is that we're going to keep wildfires 10 acres or less 90% of the time, 10 acres or less 90% of the time. And what's interesting is I was looking back at a textbook that's almost 100 years old and that metric was there. And so what do we need to do today to keep wildfires 10 square feet or less? And that may be sound ambitious, but when you have the ability for early detection, early response, control autonomously followed up by boots on the ground for that containment, that I think that we're gonna create different um, scenarios for public safety to control some of our wildland fires and respond more efficiently. Excellent point. Mr. Misenheimer, what about you with uh, obstacles? What have you encountered? 
that you would share with the uh, attendees, the audience? Well, obviously our program is just uh, three years old. So it, it, to me, yeah. it's still a new program and getting all of our responders within our response area to understand the capabilities and the limitations. And I know it's that's an educational issue, but I, I truly feel like, uh, you know, just was with manned aircraft and a FLIR, uh, we're dealing with the same things with heavy tree cover when we're trying to go in to help uh, locate a lost subject or uh, airspace issues in certain areas. And, and obviously our responders uh, that are not familiar with drone operations or aircraft operations don't understand that. So there's obstacles that we have to do if we're going to be able to fly the missions that we're, we're requested to do. So it's more of an educational issue. And, and until it's important to them, I don't know if they'll retain that information. Uh, as far as uh, what we can and cannot do. Any ideas on how to address that educational piece? Because I think that's going to be a, a concern of a lot of communities as they continue down this path. Any ideas to share? I, I, I think outreach, obviously, we have uh, multiple volunteer departments within the county mm -hmm. that we work with hand in hand. And uh, also we work with law enforcement. And I think uh, just getting an education piece out to them during their uh, in-service or continuing education training is valuable for moving forward. It's just trying to get that information to those that'll listen to us. Thank you, sir. Chief Rosemary, talk about obstacles. What have you encountered? Well, first of all, I want to say, Chief Muncie, I think we have cattle ranches as big as, in Texas as big as your county. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, several, uh, number one, funding. You know, and we're probably a medium-sized department. We have 11 fire stations, 270 firefighters, uh, run about 25,000 calls a year, but just funding for the drone program itself. In fact, the two we had, I went out and got donated through two different organizations. One was our local uh, exchange club. They donated a drone to us. And then the second one was, uh, and I'm going to give this organization a plug, uh, the National Public Safety Drone Donation Program. Uh, they're going out and seeking funding from organizations and companies to help first responders get drones, and they're donating drones to uh, first responding organizations. So it's a great organization. So funding number one, uh, personnel. Uh, like I said, we have 275, 270 firefighters, 11 fire stations. We can't keep enough. We, we actually are, are in mandatory overtime almost every day. So we don't even have the personnel to run a drone system right now. Uh, we're short. Um, and I think that's pretty much across the nation. Fire departments have a shortage of, of people. So who's actually going to run this drone? Uh, I know fire departments that have, they have a drone program, but it's just sitting on a shelf because they don't have the staff to actually fly it when they need it. Uh, the buy-in, the culture, you know, the culture in the, in the department, the buy-in. Um, honestly, our, our second drone was was crashed because they were treating it like a toy, kind of like Chief Muncie said, the shiny little no, shiny new object. They were treating it like a toy as they were practicing with it at the station. They ran it into the fire station wall. And, you know, just trying to get that buy-in from it, you need to find people that actually will take ownership of the program and take ownership of the drone and realize that it's an asset, it's a tool, it's not a toy. So that, just, just a few of the, of the hurdles that we're facing in the fire service. Chief, that, that you brought some good points. Um, any advice, you know, because I think, you know, there are a lot of both law enforcement, fire service that may be, well, it's situational. We have a drone program. Maybe, you know, it's in the back of our car or in the back of our truck. We'll put the drone up when we're told to put the drone up. But do you see a movement um, towards having dedicated programs? Can you have just, it's certainly, they're a tool, right? And I think everyone would say they're a necessity now. They play a pivotal role in, in fire service, law enforcement services, et cetera. But do we need to move more professionalized this, this program so it's a dedicated program from your perspective? Uh, yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, the problem is the funding. We go back to it's just, you know, where's the funding for it? Where's, the, where's that land in the priority? Uh, now, like I so said, the first drone we had, uh, we lost it on actual uh, water rescue, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't find the the woman. She, she ended up perishing in the in the in the accident, but it did create a lot more buy-in because some of the uh, some of the firefighters and, and frankly, one of the other battalion chiefs who was anti-drone at the time called me up afterwards and said, "Look, hey, I was the incident commander on that call, and I now realized the the." benefit of that asset that tool and and i support 100 so if you whatever you need in the future let me know so yeah we definitely need to to make it more of a uh, almost its own division in the fire service 
anyone else want to weigh in on that that notion of, of having a dedicated program? It can't you know it can't be one or the other. Maybe we you know need to move towards anybody. Rich, I'm going to come to you and we'll ask the question about obstacles and and chief lane. But anyone else have any insight into that dedicated program notion or changing the culture of our of these fire service organizations? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I think that it's it's worthwhile to say that we need several programs, right? Um, some of the drones that we're now using in the fire service extremely expensive. They're best used as a service. Um, some of the, the say the overwatch on wildland fires. Um, uh, again, so I think a shared service there, having uh, line of sight drones, there's definitely a lot of use cases out there. And there were some good ones that were brought up on commercial fires and, and hazardous materials. And I think that you could create sections within your fire department there as well. For us, we've taken our, our wildland and aviation division and expanded it to aviation and UAS in order to start getting a hold of all the drones that we were starting to see come into the organization and start creating what those sections look like. It's really important to have a dedicated program because um, we don't want the firefighters having bright and shiny toys that they're not trained to use and, and is worse when they're gathering information, they're not taking the information, disseminating it through the incident command system. Instead, they're keeping the information up here. So we need to create the programs that create the pathways for us to be able to use the information that we're collecting with the drones into the organization. Thank you, Chief. Anyone else want to address the dedicated program notion or have any insight? All right. Uh, can Fire I jump fight? in there? Sure, you can. Come on, Chief. Um, just some thoughts, I guess. Been relatively small and compact as an island. Uh, you're probably aware that uh, the police have a national police aviation service. So there's some thought about putting their drone services into that so it can be provided nationally. So that would be a separate program and that could be funded, um, you know, more readily. So there's some thought as well so that the fire services would do a similar thing so that the drone service, if you like, would serve nationally and be at um, you know, appropriate locations throughout the country. Another, because we've only got um, just over 45 fire departments in the whole of the United Kingdom. You know, each one is quite big so that they could be located readily. Um, and that would hopefully overcome the issues of funding because as an individual fire service or department, it echoes the same problem, lack of funding, is a is an enormous barrier and as you say uh, uh chief munsey you know th these devices now are becoming much more expensive thank you firefighter hazmat technician rich gutanis talk about obstacles you you certainly have one of the premier hazmat programs in the country talk about some of your obstacles that you encountered um <clears throat> i would say actually the biggest obstacles we can't get out of our own way um, fire service is 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress seems like and uh, sometimes our own people our own uh, old school habits and ways of doing things kind of get in the way and, and having technology step in to fill some gaps sometimes can bend the wrong people the wrong way so uh, even today even after seven years of having this program we still find ourselves getting pushback from from folks internally that just don't see the 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 uh, potential use, or even though we've had a very successful uh, program, um, I, I think uh, some of the other couple things that were mentioned were, you know, spot on. Like when it comes to funding, right? Law enforcement, most of their funding comes from, you know, seizures, uh, uh, funds that they get from um, their special operations team. So they don't have to cut it out of the same slice of pie, whereas ours comes out of the operating budget for the most part. So trying to support it on that end is, is challenging. Um, but the key is, uh, I think, early on is to, to get the buy-in not only from your agency, uh, top-down, but you have to get the constituents of your community, too. And I think one of the things that we did really well early on was our outreach program, where we, anytime we were doing training or any special event that we had going on, we would invite our local media folks out to see what we're doing so they can kind of get an eye on, they see the, the aircraft and what we're doing, how we're using it. And that turned out to be uh, important because any time that they needed some filler stuff too, they would say, hey, you guys doing any drone stuff? And we'd say, yeah, come on out. Um, and it, it put a good positive spin on the on what we're doing. And I also think that that helped 
paved the way for the law enforcement agencies here in, in the county too. So we were the first ones in the county to, to run a drone. And uh, now almost all of the law enforcement agencies as well are, are using drones and they got the buy-in. I think we helped uh, with that early on showing how these tools, it's a tool, you know, for safety and whatnot, especially for law enforcement folks. Um, and just to kind of allude also to go back to the, uh, you know, continuing the program and getting the right people, we, our program is set up a little differently. So our, our pilots are our hazmat technicians also. So in order to be a, a one of the pilots, you have to be a tech. And that was important for us because one, our techs are typically a little more, uh, they have that buy-in when it comes to hazmat specifically, right? They're, they're more, you know, tech driven, they lots of meters and whatnot. So the, the drone piece was not a huge, huge um, bridge to cross for them. Uh, but it also puts the experts on the controllers that are also the hazmat experts, right? So they know what they're looking for. They understand what their, uh, the tasks are. And, um, and that just allowed us to open the doors up to do a lot more advanced kind of stuff and um but the long term you know the future of the program is always you know it's just it's a it's a bad day away from from being grounded and, and i don't know if you guys are tracking the the issues we have in the state of florida now with the legislation recently passed where we are our drones are uh we have a limitation on drones we can use now there's a blue uas list uh, five drones that the uh, as of january 1st we have to discontinue the use of any drone that's not on that list so um, from a funding perspective, we we best definitely got kicked in the teeth there. We're all trying to scramble and figure that out. But um, you know, just like anything else, it's constant challenges that we've got to keep trying to overcome. Thank you, um, Chief Lane. What about uh, get, get another uh, question for you? What types of organizations are taking up the use of drones for fire and rescue in the United Kingdom? Well. Um... I should start off by explaining the the sort of uh, rescue services in the UK. It's a, a patchwork quilt of about 440 organisations, which include uh, mountain rescue, fire, fire and rescue, uh, law enforcement, ambulance, uh, your paramedics, the hazardous area response team, particularly, which is nationally set up for the NHS, which has, you know, specialist response teams and a lot of other voluntary um, organizations and search and rescue services all have a great enthusiasm um, for the use of drones for uh, search and rescue, uh, surveillance, risk mitigation and so on. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of people coming into it if you like but as i said before over half sorry two-thirds of perhaps fire and rescue are using them over half of police services or law enforcement are using them so there's quite a you know a, a wide variety of these organizations but again as always though um perhaps there's some conflict a lot of them tend to develop their own standard operational procedures which don't necessarily um, meet up, particularly in terms of staffing, you know, uh, pilot observer safety, somebody else who's doing the observation on the command unit and so on. So there's a lot of issues that still have yet to be ironed out between these different organizations. Thank you. Going back to what we've talked about, I'm going to ask you this. I, I was part of a meeting and it, it, was, it was a law enforcement meeting. And one of the, uh, the chiefs uh, got up and almost made it sound like if you're not using drones, I don't want to say it's a, a dereliction of duty, but almost to that point, like you have this tool, it, it has the ability, whether whatever the application is. My panel, do you, do you believe that in the current day, if you're not embracing this type of technology, I know the challenges we've talked about, the funding, certainly the dedicated program. But is this an, a tool that is absolutely a necessity to first responder professions at this time? Chief Monty, I'll start with you and anybody else can weigh in. It's just an open question. Yeah, great question. So that's interesting. I think about what are the firefighter bill of rights that we should give our firefighters. And one of those is definitely situational awareness in, in a variety of different um, cases. But I think that it does play on funding and it, and it, and it does play into ability and it de depends on the situation. 
and it depends on how well your your organization is integrating the information that's received from the drones into its operation and so I, I wouldn't advocate that any fire chief just goes out and buy drones and I think that we see that too much we need to have a better structure um, that we're teaching our fire chiefs and our organizations on how to utilize the drones correctly I think the point of I think it popped up there was a question of, of should, have we thought about using volunteers to utilize drones I think that there really is a use case there again our concern that we see with a lot of fire departments is they're just take, simply taking a firefighter out of a fight they're flying a drone they're receiving the information but they're not disseminating the information so in those cases now I think that you're doing yourself a, a, a disservice but if you're truly utilizing UASs in the proper fashion and you're disseminating that information uh, in a safe way back to the organization um, without removing that firefighter from the fight as, as Chief Roseberry said, we just simply don't have enough firefighters out there in most organizations. And then I do think it's a fundamental operational bill of rights that we should be providing to our, our, our citizens and residents that we serve and our firefighters to keep them safe. Thank you. Anyone else have uh, any insight into that question that would like to respond? I was thinking, uh, like Chief Muncie's kind of kind of add on to what he's saying. I, you know, it, it's a technology that that improves our operational abilities and our situational awareness. Uh, if you don't have the people to to do it, do you do you take somebody away from the firefight and and dedicate to the drones? And I'd have to say at this point, no, because you know we we have fewer fires today than we used to, but it still takes just as many people to put it out when we do have one. So the, our primary purpose is to mitigate that incident. Uh, the drones definitely help us mitigate it in a safer way. I think that one of the things that, that needs to happen is if you want to institute a drone program, you've got to be strategic about it. You've got to look down the road at five, you know, two, three, five years down the road or even farther, because you may have the, the guy that's the, the proponent for it now, and he's, in, and he's the drone guy. But the way the fire service works, he's only going to be in that position for two years, and then he's going to promote or move on. And then who's going to be the, the person that comes in behind him and takes over the program? And is it going to be somebody that really buys into it or somebody that you just put in the position because you had to fill that vacancy? So I think you really got to be strategic and think long term about it. And we were talking a little bit about funding earlier. Funding isn't just purchasing the drone. It's the training, it's the, it's the part 107 licenses. It's, it's, it, the funding is, is an ongoing expense for this too. So, you know, you've gotta be strategic about implementing this, the, the drone program. Uh, I would like to see it part of the future of the fire service for sure. Anyone else have any insight into that question before we move on? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to agree with uh, Chiefs Rosebury and Muncie. It really has to be a strategic decision um, we still view, I think, well, two views. Drones are absolutely necessary to the future. However, we still see it in its own silo, and it's not as yet integrated into all our strategic operational procedures and our standard operational procedures. That's the problem. It seems as a great little tool to bolt on where you've got it. It really needs to be integral to our operations, whether that's in search or fire or law enforcement um because it's a game changer and yeah. certainly in gathering you know intelligence and surveillance and risk mitigation it changes the whole picture so why isn't it strategically universally accepted good point and i, I just want to add to it too real quick I, I think it's important for those of us who do have drone programs because I, I i think it's an integral part too as well i think um I think Charles Warner said it best once that, you know, the, the access is there and for you not to be able to at least have access to a drone, whether it's yours or somebody else's, another agency's or something is, can, you know, borderline on ne uh, negligence down the road. So um, because the, the, the tools are there. So I think it, it, it falls on those of us who are currently running drone programs to, to do reach out. And one of the things that we do is we offer, because it's on our hazmat truck and our hazmat truck can go anywhere in the county it wants to, uh, if anybody needs a drone, no matter what agency that we border with or law enforcement or fire needed uh, UAS operations for their event, uh, you know, some a missing person in the water that might not be in our jurisdiction, we go help. And because we can, when you put that technology in front of these other folks, eventually they're going to catch on. Like I mentioned about our, all of our law enforcement partners here in the county, 
they're all running those programs now because we offered it up to them early on and they were able to benefit from that and they saw the, the benefits of it. Um, and now we have a great relationship where if I needed an additional pilot or I was shorthanded that day and I needed some batteries, I could call uh, the sheriff's office and they would show up. And it just it built a bridge amongst the agencies that wasn't there before. So I think just it, it behooves us to uh, to reach out and become that uh, asset for a, a neighboring agencies. Thank you. Wanted to move on to uh, so we know this we've presented based on the questions you guys have shed the light on some of the challenges you're having. Funding certainly uh, is one of them, and, and maybe a dedicated program. And do we do it? Do we not do it? staffing resources, but I think one of the other key areas, and I know it's, it's talked about a little bit, but I'd like to elaborate on it, collaborating with your community, you know, and the dip, getting different buy-in wherever you are. And does anyone have any good examples or, you know, bits of information we can share with our, our viewers? So what you have done to really sell it to your community, get, get your local uh, politicians on board, your mayor, your county administrator, something along those lines. I think that's a very important area. Does anyone have any insight to share? that went really well uh, and, and give uh, our viewers information on how to do it. So it's, we just recently had a wide scale flooding in our area. And it's funny if, if you're flying a, a drone on a normal sunny day and people come outside, they're, they're almost perturbed that you're flying a drone, right? But the moment that there's flooding or there's danger or, or they're cut off because their roads are impassable the moment they see a drone they're jumping up and down and waving their arms so we need to find successes in our uas's and we need to share those successes we need the media support in this has been explained to highlight the great things and i loved what rich was saying about inviting the media out for their training to get them engaged in the drone uses but we also have to be very respectful of people's rights and to make sure that we we, we have that social contract with them where they know that we're gonna be using our drones to collect the surveillance that we need and monitoring in a trustworthy fashion. So highlight the successes when they occur, make sure that you're truly using them in emergency situations, work with the media and your PIOs to, to push out the UAS of drones and how they're creating more efficient and safer environments that they're leading towards those successes. I think all of those kind of come to the point where um, it'll be more and more accessible, uh, you know, acceptable to the public that we're using these drones in the heavily populated areas that we serve. Thanks, Chief. Anyone else have any good insight we can share? Is how do you sell it to your community? How do you get the collaboration uh, in more of a proactive manner? I, I would say too, we, like uh, Chief was just mentioning, that you, we all have that aha moment when you you use a drone and you realize, hey, this actually works, right? And it becomes a, a big thing. It's it, it's a scene that you you were able to see something that you didn't see, you wouldn't have seen before without without the the systems or you cut that mitigation response time in half or whatever the case may be because you had a piece of equipment that you didn't have before. Um, and those are those ones that really work out well. And, and one of the things that we do here quite often is um, we, we make our own videos. We put everything available on our YouTube channel for folks to see because you know there's a lot of things that we're doing that I think there's agencies can benefit from and rather than everybody try to reinvent the wheel, you know, hey, this is this is how we're doing it. Let, if you guys want to, you know, try these tactics and practices. So it just kind of it's a open forum and and you know shares the tactics and with other agencies and it really has has worked out pretty well. I've gotten to meet a lot of interesting characters from all across the country. They're doing running drones in their in their response. So um, that's just our way of outreach. Okay, thank you, sir. Anyone else have any uh, insight, words of wisdom? tips and how to collaborate with your community. No, I'll just point out in chat that Charlie put up some great information on drone responders and how they have CAN programs to assist agencies with getting this information out there. Thank you, Charlie, for that. Thanks, Charlie. Brian, Brian I'll mention briefly that uh, we've become, obviously, uh, we're trying to work with our county public information office and getting some certified drone operators within that section, but we're currently in use and requested a lot by our county office when we're not involved in emergency response for uh, aerial imagery of anything that the county's trying to get out to the public. And typically they're uh, stating that we're taking, you know, using drone imagery for that. So that's just one little way that we're getting information out to the public that there is uh, other uses of it. 
for the for the county. Chief Lane, do you have anything to add uh, from your perspective? No, it. Uh, I think the main thing is uh, one of outreach and education. It it's um, you know once you demonstrate the utility of of drones. Uh, as uh, as was said, the light bulb moment, Rich, pe people's uh, bulbs go on, they get it. But that's still a work in progress, isn't it? And that's, you know, part of the uh, the problem that we have is trying to reach other people and educate them on the utility of these uh, devices. Right. One question that's MITRE is interested in is, you know, as we are involved in our initiatives, are there drone capabilities or features that aren't meeting your needs that are on the shelf? And when you're going through and procuring stuff, looking for payload, capacity, autonomy, what does that look like? And how is that experience done? Anyone have any insight, Chief? Yeah, that's an amazing broad question. Uh, let me let me break it down. So, um, and I mentioned four or five use cases early on in the conversation. So we're looking at for uh, suppression of activities, for ignition activities, for communication, for surveillance, monitoring, logistics. Um, the capabilities of drones are continuing to improve, but I'll just focus on one of those, um, and I could probably do it for all those use cases, right? But logistics, what's available now with a um, an electric motor drone, the capabilities aren't quite there for what the industry needs. And so um, looking at variable pitch turbine type drones, for instance, or the conversion of type one helicopters um, or helicopter based platforms to meet some of these needs continue to be explored by a lot of the companies that are out there. And I think that those are going to quickly start surpassing the piloted aircraft that we see creating safer scenarios, both for the pilots themselves, the responders and the citizens that we serve. Um, so I hope I narrowed that down a little bit, but yeah, a very broad question. Yeah, thank you. Rich, what about you, hazmat area? Did you find what you needed in terms of endurance, capability, everything that you needed for your hazmat uh, uh, team? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the challenge is we, we obviously have to work around the technology that's available to us now. Um, and, you know, longer duration, heavier lift, capabilities, all that stuff is stuff that we want to see, and, and that'll come down down the road. Uh, this, the technology changes so rapidly, and that's one of the downsides to the drones is, uh, you know, like, I'll use a fire nozzle, we'll keep that fire nozzle on the truck for 10 years if it still works, whereas mm -hmm. drone tech changes so rapidly, uh, you know, what was a 15-minute flight time, we're getting 50-minute flight times now, mm -hmm. and that was two years ago. So, the, to, to Try to keep up with the technology is expensive because you you know you're hoping to get two or three years out of your aircraft. A three year old aircraft is a dinosaur in the this industry. So, yeah. um, but the the technology is is pretty is 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 always fascinating to me. We we love the fact that one in five years ago we were zip tying radiation detection onto to a drone, and today uh, FLIR and and Sniffer 40 they're integrating this detection equipment right into the aircraft, which is super cool to see that kind of stuff. So, and, and just to know that we we were in the early stages of all that kind of stuff is, is pretty exciting. Thanks, Rich. Rich, I know you have to leave us shortly uh, for a work-related matter. We very much appreciate you coming onto our panel, sharing your insight, and we look forward to interacting with you in the future as well. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Yeah, they, I'm on duty, they're making me do fireman stuff now, so I'm gonna have to get going, but that was nice work uh, talking with you guys and uh, we'll be safe and we'll hopefully see you down the road. Sounds good, thank you. Bye-bye. Chief Lane, do you have a question? Oh, just, no. No, um, I'm just gathering my thoughts there in, in, in terms of, um, you asked what else, perhaps using AI, uh, to recognize um, humans at the initial part of search. Um, you know, that that is something that could be usefully developed, particularly in area-wide searches. And I was thinking uh, our interest here in particular is area-wide floods and the loss of, uh, you know, missing persons in, in those floods. So perhaps the use of AI uh, to recognize individuals in the water. 
Thank you. So we're going to transition. Uh, we're going to we got about five minutes left to, for our panel discussion. Then we're going to transition to about ten minutes worth of questions. We got questions coming in that we'll get to. So, Chief Montana, we'll start with you. Um, what do you think is the potential for drones in the fire service down the road? Thinking outside the box, you know, do you see? I'll, I'll put this out there. Do you see drone as a first responder like you've seen in some of our law enforcement communities? But futuristically speaking, where do you think this is going in the fire service? Understanding we, you know, we talked about the challenges. We know those exist, but if you had that magic wand, what type of drone program would you want in your department? Again, there's not one size fits all, but uh, human cargo. I think is going to be an absolute game changer for most responding agencies to be able to get our, our responders to a location uh, in a quicker fashion to be able to transport patients. Um, I, I think that that's going to be fantastic when we get to that point. Uh, the cost points need to be driven down, I think, would, um, would be something that we would really look forward to. Um, heavier lift, again, there's so many different missions that are available. Uh, better uh, sensors are needed, but I, I can't even imagine where the next 20 years is going to go with UAS, but I do know that there's going to be a lot more autonomy involved in uh, the flight, so there's going to be a lot more missions that are going to be using AI, as, as, um, as David was talking about earlier, to do a lot of things that humans are now required to do now. There's going to be better data collection. Uh, we, we always struggle with the amount of data, and is it accurate? And I think that is, as we're using the US and the AI and ML machine learning to do these things, I think all of those together, again, are going to create better uh, surveillance and monitoring and uh, information back to those responders. Um, information sharing, we're seeing a lot of integration right now between the drones and into our, our common operating platforms which is helpful. So instead of um, a first responder looking at a screen, we're able to share those in a much more wide scale environment, uh, sharing resources between uh, various agencies, uh, military grade DOD um, surveillance that we see that we've utilized in some of the wildfires. I think some of those things are, are available here in the next year. Um, again, the drones are changing so quick. The, the, the technologies and the capabilities are changing, that it's just gonna be a fantastic world. What I do know is this, is that we need Charles and his organization, drone responders to help us paint a picture of the future so that the practitioners in there understand what is the culture that we need to develop between the citizens and our, our firefighters and our first responders. What's the training that's going to be required to meet these new missions? What are the laws and regulations um, that we're going to need to enact through the federal government, state governments, um, through local codes and policies, the FAA? How are we going to reconfigure our budgets to meet this new need? And um, you know, obviously a lot of us have talked about taking firefighters out of the fight as you're, you're using line of sight drones. But at the end of the day, we got to recognize that drones create those efficiencies that may allow us to take a first responder and reallocate. Um, so I'm going to shut up now because I spoke a little bit on that question, but it's an exciting future. Thank you, Chief. Chief. Mr. Missenheimer, what do you think? I have to agree with Chief Muncy. Uh, I think the technological changes uh, that we're going to be facing in the drone response for for emergency responders and also in the industry and and something that's going to have to be monitored obviously and it's going to be hard to keep up with will be the legal changes or the the changes as far as uh, operation because i know drone is a first responder that's going to be uh significant over the next few years i know it's in its new stages uh it's, it's widespread throughout certain areas of california but on the east coast i think it's it's not very common and i think uh the challenges to maintaining certifications and getting people up to speed and uh, taking somebody that doesn't have any kind of aviation background and, and getting them to learn the drone side because they're still a pilot. So that's, that's going to, I think the changes and challenges on certifications is going to increase drastically as uh, the technological changes increase. Thank you. Chief Roseberry. I think that, uh, a little bit on what Chief Muncy hit on, kind of the automated drone response without the need for line of sight. I know that's going to take FAA uh, regulation clearance. 
but I, did, I like what Chula Vista Police Department's doing. And I believe I read the other day that one of our neighbors, Rowlett Police Department, just got approval to do the same similar thing. In the fire service, we could do that for all kinds of alarms, you know, the commercial fire alarms, the water alarms. Uh, for those of us with interstates in our jurisdictions, sending a drone out there, because sometimes even finding the accident on the interstate, and then even if you found it, which direction to travel, what's the best way to get on it, an automatic drain, drone going up there, finding it for you, and then sending you direct the best travel route to get there. I mean, that, that'd be a game changer too, getting us on scene. Automated drones getting to the scene and giving instructions to the people are delivering, like uh, I believe I've seen in Europe, they're, they're delivering AEDs. I see that in the United States. I mean, the 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 potential is, is limitless of what they're pop, able to do. And it's just some of its regulation, some of its funding, some of it's just the technology's not quite there yet. Thank you, Chief. Chief Lane, where's this all going in the future from your perspective? We got the US perspective and what do you, what do you think of well, international, UK, where's this going? Well, I think the picture that's been painted is unlimited the possibilities uh for example it's not beyond you know technological uh possibilities of having pre-positioned uh drones next to high risks uh beyond visual line of sight reacting through artificial intelligence uh to assist people to suppress fires to get pictures you know, I, th I think the whole thing is extremely exciting, but I guess the big thing again is the limitation of funding. I don't think it's limited by technology. It's probably funding and the use of people and perhaps changing roles as well. Uh, you know, who would have thought a firefighter uh, using water to suppress uh, a, a, a fire is now being a pilot and, and maybe controlling assets which are miles away uh, to do the same task. Thank you. Boy, certainly funding has uh, been talked about quite a bit. That's one of the areas that needs to be looked at along with the uh, the technology. You know, what is this technology gonna look like and how can we continue to further advance it? Uh, we're down to our last couple of minutes here. I got one question that I'm gonna ask everyone. Um, and then to, if time allows, we'll go uh, further into questions, but. Uh, what is one thing you wish you knew before starting your drone program? Or one thing that, that you wish somebody would have provided you some guidance or uh, Charles Warner would have called you before you started your program say, well, did you ever think about this? What does that look like, anyone? I think I would have, I wish somebody had said, you know, you know there's a lot of companies out there that are offering fire services uh, the support on, on how to start up a program and help you start up a program. And I think that they understand how the FAA regulations work, the licensing works, you know, the different types of drones and cost points. I think reaching out to one of them, it, it may cost you a little bit of money up front, but I think it'll save you a lot of money and headache down the road. Thanks, Chief. Anyone else have any insights? What would you wish you have known before starting your program or the different applications of your program? So I think what's interesting is what what should we know now that we're going to need in ten years? Well, that's um, another way of looking at it too. Yeah, and I think that that's more pertinent to the question right now. I think a lot of us, when we when we first started getting drones, we viewed them as novelties to the fire service. Now, what we recognize is that they're essentials to our operations. A variety of difference. So I'm a planner by nature. I I, I tend to think. You know, what do we need to do to, to get to a future point? So I would recommend, as, as Chief Roseberry was alluding to, that if you don't have that capability within yourself or your organization to reach out to those associations or companies that are able to help you visualize um, where you're going to need to be in 10 years and develop as a leader uh, what we're training, what cultural changes, what budgets uh, impacts um, what, what policies are you going to need in your organization? How are you going to build the background and infrastructure to ensure that you're utilizing this um, over the next 10 years? Because the way we use drones today is not the way we're going to use drones tomorrow. And the way we're going to use tomorrow are vastly different depending on the service and the location, the municipality and the culture of your organization and the communities that you serve. 
Keith, excellent points. Anyone else have uh, any words of wisdom they'd like to share? I think, you know, even starting right now, moving forward, what does it need to look at, look like right now? You know, the support, the technology. Does anyone else have any insight they'd like to share as we wrap up uh, this morning's panel? Chief Rosebury, anything? No, but I was wondering if it'd be possible for me to plug a technology conference Chief Muncie and I are working on. Absolutely. Uh, next month in Irving, Texas is going to be the IFC's newest technology conference, uh, Technology Summit International, TSI. And we're, it's three days of nothing but technology, uh, education presentations, and the drone conversation is definitely going to happen there. Um, so if, you want, if anybody's interested, just go to the IFC website and look for TSI. Sounds good. We plan to be there, um, MITRE representatives, so we're grateful for that. Panel, can't thank you enough. On behalf of MITRE, uh, uh, Yasri, our boss, uh, Dr. King, we appreciate it all. And uh, thank you for being part of it, Chief Muncie, Mr. Misenheimer, uh, Chief Scott uh, Roseberry, and Chief Lane. Again, we thank you, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you in, in the future. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of your morning. Well, Thank so you. as Appreciate we transition it. to our next panel, our industry panel, it's with great pleasure that I introduce the next uh, moderator. Um, Chief Charles Warner, he's been referenced uh, several times. He's a well-respected, uh, retired Charlottesville Fire Department Chief, 45 years of public safety uh, service, has served on numerous and has numerous leadership roles at all levels uh, in response to drones authored 120 plus publications, uh, executive director of drone responders. I think there's consensus here that certainly one of the most influential leaders in the US shaping the drone space for first responders. We're also grateful to have uh, him as part of our MITRE team advising us on, on what role we should play in this area. And our partnership with drone responders, as you can see, has also referenced a lot of resources, uh, part of uh, drone responders. Chief Warner, I hand the baton over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. First, I want to thank MITRE uh, for actually stepping in because what you haven't heard so far is uh, their commitment to really being involved in supporting fire rescue and public safety in the area of drones. So there's a lot more you're going to hear about what's coming from MITRE. So I want to make, make sure I tip the hat to them. Uh, there's been a lot of things that have been mentioned, and I want to make sure that I do say this to everybody hears it, is that dronesponders.org is a free organization uh, that has resources, information, 800 documents, SOPs, COA guidance, uh, and a lot more. Uh, so go there and join for free and take access to that. We also have the largest dashboard online with over 1,200 agencies sharing their program information, what they fly, how many missions they fly, the number of remote pilots. Uh, I, will, I do want to hit on one of the thing, most important things that's out there. Before you start a program, you do need to talk to your community. You need to do an outreach program. That means hands-on, town hall meetings, uh, with the media to make sure they understand what you're doing and what you're not going to be doing. Uh, we have an outreach program in the resource center, which you can customize for your own department. Now I want to switch over to the panelists uh, that are with me today, and I'm I'm really pleased to, rec to uh, reference John Redman from Brink, uh, Vern Salee from Exxon Air, and Fritz Reber from Skydio. I will tell you that what's interesting is that they all three came from Chula Vista, so it just shows you how, how impressive the program has been in Chula Vista and the influence it's having on the industry specific. I wanna jump right in first to talk about drones as a first responder. It's been kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, and I wanna start with Fritz to talk about what that looked like when you started uh, and, and how that has changed uh, the situational awareness for Chula Vista. Well, it's obviously grown quite a bit since we started. Uh, the first mission, I think it was in October, 2018. That was probably a year and a half after Vern actually started the program. I took it over and kind of got sidetracked with the idea of getting the drone out ahead of ground units. Um, we had the tailwind of the IPP from the FAA. They're an initiative that really put the spotlight on Chula Vista and gave us sort of the, the permission uh, to, to get creative. And it was a partnership between the public sector and the private sector, as mentioned in the previous panel. So the idea was just get this valuable asset, right? The eyes on the scene, get it ahead of ground units, get it there as soon as possible. Time is of the essence. 
So what would it take to do that? And so having drones that are pre-positioned, ready to go at a moment's notice, as soon as you hear of an incident, wherever it might be, you, you know, your first, everyone's responding, but a drone obviously can get there probably much quicker. And once it arrives, have a better angle of view, a better situational awareness and sharing that stream uh, with the responding unit so they know what they're going into. And that, that's an asset for, uh, you know, all public safety, both police and fire. Um, Chula Vista's, you know, using it in both disciplines effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that's kind of what everyone wants to replicate, uh, you know, just getting their drones on scene as quick as possible, doing it, providing value as soon as possible. And that's just DFR in essence. In essence. Okay, and Vern, I'm going to go to you next. I want to, I want to transition into, um, as you were working on DFR and you were going to the IPP and having the meetings, it also developed into a tactical beyond visual line of sight waiver. Can, can you tell how the, the drones of first responder helped to transition into that particular operation, which now allows us to, to fly in those dangerous missions, 1500 feet laterally, true beyond visual line of sight over and around buildings for those dangerous missions? Sorry about that. Uh, thanks again for having me here in uh, uh, MITRE. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, so absolutely, we were probably, uh, you know, a year, year and a half into the IPP with DFR. Um, and again, Tactical Beyond Visual Line of Sight actually was a, a project that, you know, Fritz, I think, kind of dreamed up and worked with you on uh, to, to, to do. And, and you were instrumental and Drone Responders was instrumental in getting this passed through the FAA. I think we built built up a lot of uh, credit uh, in, in our in our bank with the FAA in terms of our success at Chula Vista. Uh, you know, we we uh, were doing drone as first responder. We were doing it very very responsibly. We were flying, you know, safely both with regard to air risk and ground risk, and we showed what could be accomplished. We were really giving them hard data that they needed to show the IPP was successful. But also, you know, as great as DFR is for a strategic view, we were realizing that we lacked a tactical view, the close-in view that our officers needed uh, to, to see. Um, and oftentimes that might be, we need to, to, to look around a corner uh, before the officers go in perhaps an active shooter uh, situation uh, or fly around to the backside of a house and drop down below the tree line. Um, so uh, that type of tactical use really is technically uh, against traditional FAA rules of, of digital line of sight. And so uh, working you know, with you and, and uh, the FAA, we're able to get this tactical beyond visual line of sight waiver so that our officers on the ground would not have to expose themselves to danger. Instead, we could send a robot, essentially a drone uh, into areas where it would drop down and we could no longer see it, but we could have, uh, you know, we control the scene, right? So we know who's there, who's not. So we eliminate the ground risk. And also we have still great um, airspace awareness because again, we control the scene. Um, and so we can we fly tactical beyond visual line of sight very safely with the FAA's waiver. And once the emergency is done, uh, we no longer fly beyond visual line of sight. We're visual line of sight again only. So it's tremendous uh, uh, accomplishment uh, for, for our operations and, it, you know, DFR really uh, laid the groundwork for the FAA to have confidence to grant that. So Don, next, you've, you've seen the transition from where you started. Can you tell a little bit more about where the program is today? How many flights have been flown and what are some, what maybe is a great experience of uh, what you've learned and, and how the fire service is also now being a part of this program? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just want to make sure everybody understands kind of the, the concept of drone as a first responder. So um, you, we uh, at Chula Vista have an officer who is in the police department who is monitoring incoming 911 calls um, fr from a, a software called Live 911. So they actually hear the 911 call um, and see the location. So if you have somebody who's calling in saying, help, 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 the drone operator um, doesn't need any other information because the location is based there. So they immediately will launch a drone. Um, there are four launch locations within Chula Vista that are strategically placed so that they cover the entire city, uh, 52 square miles. And many times they're on scene, um, sometimes before uh, dispatch even has the call in, in, their, um, in the queue for CAD. 
and how we, we transition from not just a police department resource, but as a fire department resource is um, all of the officers and the battalion chiefs within the fire department have the ability to pull up the live feed from the drone that is overhead. So we would launch a drone um, for, for all incidents um, where we think a overhead um, aerial view could assist first responders. So it could be a traffic collision and you're thinking, well, what is a drone going to show for a traffic collision? But what was brought up um, before was, well, what if the, the vehicle is overturned? The battalion chief, the fire department that's responding can look, is the person trapped in there? Is it, le is it leaking fuel? Is it on fire? What is the traffic conditions? What's the best way to get there? So there's a lot of information that the battalion chiefs are using to have that game plan when they arrive on scene. Uh, we've launched multiple times for house fires and we'll get on scene and we'll do the infrared so that the fire department can see where the hot spots are on the house. So they already have a game plan there before they even arrive. Um, so we know moments like this are, are really crucial in having a successful mission. We launched um, with those four launch locations, 10, seven days a week, 10 hours a day. Um, and uh, the Chula Vista Police Department is launching between 20 and 25 times a day. Uh, there are over 12,000 missions. So there's nobody in, in the country that is launching um, drones more than Chula Vista Police Department um, and showing the benefits, not just for police, but for fire and just in those type of situations. That's, that's a fantastic overview. Thank all three of you. I, I wanna make sure that some of you know that um, I saw in some of the, the question and answers in chats so was reference to how hard it is to get DFR waivers. Well, I'm, I'm gonna tell you now that that's about to change. Uh, we collectively, uh, all of us here, have been working on on this whole DFR template, simple, sim similar to the tactical beyond views on a site waiver. The first example is the city of Cavanaugh County, California, now has received their DFR waiver within two weeks. Uh, that's a dramatic change, uh, and we we believe that's going to be the template uh, that you're going to see come out to, for everybody else to have that that capability, and. Uh, interestingly enough, somebody brought up the question about volunteers, and I want to want to pull that in too as well, because the city of Campbell, California, is also looking to utilize some of their CERT volunteers, their community emergency response team members, to actually be remote pilots to help plug into that system. And one of the things that I wanted to share about DFR, which is which is really important, is you have one program here that's serving potentially all of your public safety responses. So it's not a matter of police having one, fire having one; it's one centralized organization. And similar to that point that was brought up, the thing that you should look at uh, is, is combining a team, have a, have a combined uh, law enforcement and fire team. That's being done in York County, Virginia, where the sheriff and the fire uh, are actually working together on that, which means you split the cost of the equipment, you split the responsibility of remote pilots. Uh, and when you have a fire, the law enforcement uh, pilots fly. And when it's a law enforcement event, the fire uh, pilots fly. So you don't pull away from those resources of, of your resources. So let me transition now over to the industry side of this question. Is, uh, and I'll go back to Fritz again. So Fritz, what do you see in the way of Skydio that's starting to happen when you're looking at the use cases that were referenced from, from a Skydio perspective? So I, you know, the previous panel, Chief Muncie really summed it up several times, as well as the other panelists, the, the value of autonomy. Um, the idea that it's very difficult to scale when you have a, a one pilot, dr one drone situation. Um, the idea that you could have uh, SMEs, you know, public, you know, subject matter experts who don't know a lot about drones, be able to use drones on a, on a every situation um, circumstance. So you have them, you know, getting the value of that that picture, the common operating um, picture, every single time. So the more autonomy you can integrate into the drone systems, the easier they become to use and the less you're, you're hung up on how to operate a drone, what kind of drone is being used. It just becomes sort of a ubiquitous tool. Um, an analogy that uh, my CEO at Scotty had used is, is we, we use the, the transition from smartphones, you know, the, the stupid phone to the smartphone. I think a better analogy he used was the transition to uh, computers before Microsoft Windows, where it seemed like it was you know, you had to be very skilled, you had to understand DOS, it was just hard to use. And then once uh, computer, you didn't have to be a computer expert to use computers. Computers are an everyday tool. Um, you know, training needs go way down. It's just something you do without thinking. And I think the more autonomy um, comes into the drone systems, the more that everyone's gonna be using them all the time. And a lot of the issues 
like airspace and, and, and all these other problems are just happening in the background or being solved in the background as we mature over the years. So Don, let me go to you next. Um, you're in a little bit different situation from a Brink environment starting now. I know you're gonna be transitioning in the future to the DFR that you're looking at now, but from, from the Brink perspective, what does Brink bring to the public safety as far as operations and safety? Yeah, for, for those of you who don't know, so Brink um, is a fairly new startup company. Um, it started after the, um, the Route 91 um, mass shooting in Las Vegas. Um, a, a young uh, Blake Resnick, who is our CEO and founder, uh, lives in Vegas um, and heard the challenges of the SWAT team having to make entry into this active shooter um, at, the, at the Mandalay Bay. So um, after the fact, he reached out, um, basically he, he, he was, uh, I think 18 years old, knocked on the door of the, the SWAT team at the Las Vegas Metro SWAT um, building and said, hey, do you, do you guys need an indoor drone? Um, to which they responded, well, there isn't one that, that um, we could use. So he worked with the SWAT team for about a year um, and developed an indoor um, confined space uh, UAS that could um, work um, in limited limited um, areas. So ultimately, uh, we developed a drone. It's called the Lemur. Uh, the Lemur S is is built for confined spaces. And although it was designed for SWAT operations, it has a glass breaker. It has the ability that if it crashes, you can write it. Um, you can fly it in, in, in dense um, situations. Um, when he built it um, in you know in 2021, he had the Surfside collapse um, that happened in, in um, Miami where 98 people died, tragic situation. Uh, Blake responded with, with the, the Lemur S and was able to fly into the basement of the collapsed condo. And it was that vo footage that the engineers said, we're, we're, we need to demolish this building. There's no way that we can send people in there. So when you start looking at it now that this is kind of a paradigm shift where, um, you know, the, before I'm, I'm assuming I'm not a firefighter, but at some point somebody may have had to make entry into that that building to evaluate whether or not it's safe to do so. Um, um, now we can use drones and UASs to go in there. Um, the, the drone has a uh, two-way, it's a cell phone also. So if you have somebody who's trapped, um, maybe down in a mine shaft or something, you can send the drone down there with the comms and being able to talk to the person um, safely from a distance, keeping first responders safe. So it's a different paradigm shift, um, different use case um, than, than Skydio is doing with the collision avoidance, um, but definitely part of a, a tool in the giant toolbox that um, is ever expanding. And I can also see where that could fly into large warehouses where there's fires, where you're trying to actually not put the person in harm's way. So there's there's a great Absolutely. opportunity there for, for all these drones, but Brink in particular with the, with that. So Vern, let me switch over to you now, you because you are you have a little bit wider uh, variety of things to provide for, for public safety um, and some of the resources that may even play into this discussion of autonomy and some of the other stuff uh, that you're talking about. So can you give me some perspectives from Axon is how do you see these things playing for uh, public safety and fire service? Sure, thanks. Um, and, and just for our fire friends uh, who might not be as familiar with Axon, Axon is a public safety technology company, but you're, you're probably more familiar with its prior name, Taser, the electronic stun weapons that officers wear on their belts. But uh, we transitioned to technology such as body-worn cameras, uh, in-car cameras, um, things like that um, about a decade ago, and uh, now really uh, have a, a very large market share of, of uh, you know, video streaming devices, including drones. And so um, as a public safety technology company, one of the reasons I came over to Axon when I retired was to, to knock down the barriers that I think a lot of police departments and fire departments are having in establishing and running their, their programs. You know, right now, um, you know, drones are still relatively in their, maybe not the infancy, but in their teens or tweens years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of growth still to, to, to go ahead. Um, and it's very siloed. And so our goal at Axon is to um, have a technology platform that uh, smooths out the operations of uh, all public safety uh, companies. So for instance, our platform Axon Air uh, provides a solution for live streaming for our customers, program management, which a lot of people don't really think about if you have one or two drones and one or two pilots, not that big of a deal. 
But in reality, you know, these are aircraft, right? The FAA considers them aircraft and pilots are aviators, right? You have to professionalize your program. Um, and you have to track all your flight hours, your maintenance, you know, and battery maintenance, firmware updates. There's a lot that goes on to maintaining drones. And so program management's uh, extraordinarily um, uh, important as, as you develop your program. Uh, we also store the video within our cloud, secure cloud storage um, uh, solution. Um, allow real-time sharing of information with uh, between agencies. So a police department could fly a mission and easily share a code with the fire department so they could uh, watch the, the same live stream. Um, and then also multi-platform, meaning not just a drone video stream, but we could, we could live stream, um, you know, uh, body-worn cameras, fleet cameras, drone footage, um, and we can also integrate uh, via cell phones the location of, of um, personnel on the ground. So again, much more of a, a total solution for police and fire. And uh, I just want to kind of echo what, what both Fritz and Don said about, uh, and, and echo what you said about the importance of really looking at this as a unified public safety, safety platform, right? The, uh, you know, police and fire should not be siloed on drone programs. You know, typically if, uh, if it's a city or a county, you know, it's one budget um, and, and you can much, uh, I think it's e much easier to justify the expense of a drone program if you say not only we're going to use it for police, but we're going to use it for fire, we're going to use it for public works or whatever as well, uh, that might help uh, ease the sting of any costs uh, associated. Uh, uh, all of us um, on, on the panel from Chula Vista, we were all part of uh, All Hazards IMT uh, training. We were all trained in various levels of incident uh, command. And so we all recognize the value of police and fire really just seamlessly working together. And we've, we view that as, as critical in the drone space as well. Thanks, I, I wanna to add to that. I think that it's also important. I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, really Texas uh, for what they're doing because they're doing some regional response teams where they're taking large areas and bringing all their teams together into a regional response organization so they can one, share information between, they can train collectively, and they can share resources. So you can have specialties in different areas and everyone doesn't have to buy the specialty device. They can call on that one, one device. Um, so Fritz, I'm gonna go back to you. We, you. The subject came up earlier about community outreach uh, and, the, and the whole issue of being responsible. Uh, drone responders work with Skydio to develop the five C's. Can you talk about the five C's a little bit and you know why it came about and its purpose? Yeah. Um... So the five C's were really, you know, great partnership between uh, Skydio and drone responders to really give agencies that are just starting programs, the building blocks to be, to have the elements of programs that are trusted, um, sustainable, to have the trust of the community that use um, platforms that are secure, protecting the data, protecting the privacy of the communities they serve and having policies in place and training systems in place that, uh, you know, really reflect the value of drones and make sure that the that the community understands that the agencies are using them responsibly for the benefit. Some of the points that were touched on by the previous panel, um, you know, a lot of credit to Vern, uh, the work he did setting up the Tool List of Program. You know, the five C's sort of a or a, a written culmination of some of the work he had done, and some of the work that you and I have uh, seen around agencies in terms of the ones that that have programs that are trusted and get a lot of work and don't get a lot of pushback from the community. Um, you know, back a little background on Skydia, we're the largest U.S. drone manufacturer in the country. Um, we, you know, we have NDA compliant platforms, platforms that are trusted. So we really address a lot of the concerns that Congressman Guest brought up in the previous panel. Um, we're becoming the go-to drone for both public safety, for fire and police in a lot of the regions to, that have these concerns. One of the five C's addresses this cybersecurity concern, having drones that protect the data, that are secure, that you know don't aren't at a risk of being um, you know taken over, so to speak, by a, by a, 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 some vendor that we don't have control over in the United States. Um, our partnership with Axon really reflects that, you know, with the understanding that it, that the drone is part of an ecosystem where we're saving data, protecting it, making it shareable, um, and making sure that the data is used for good. So the five C's was something that well, we wanted agencies to um, have in their back pocket when they go to their city councils and city leaders to say, what elements are you using to build your program? What standards are you gonna follow? 
Um, SCADIO ourselves has the, um, the engagement and responsible use rules that we've um, put upon ourselves as an industry because we know that we're, we're building a product, a platform that uh, people are concerned about and can be used in a negative fashion. So having partnerships with private sector that respects that and will be a good partner to these communities that are responsible to their constituencies is important. Thanks Fritz. Uh, Don and, and Vern, I wanna flip it over to you a little bit and just change gears. As it was mentioned earlier, the Jones Security Act is out there possibly changing uh, you know, what can be utilized by public safety on this issue. Uh, AUVSI just announced an industry-wide cybersecurity risk-based framework where they're going to actually take the blue UAS list that's out there, which currently, unfortunately, the blue UAS list is hurting the industry because the, the industry, in a lot of ways, is starting to use the blue UAS on the commercial side when it's not designed for that. It's designed for DOD, and it's very limited in the in the length of it. How do you think being able to expand this with the AUVSI new program that's coming out? I think the goal was to increase... Uh, the number of agents, uh, uh, companies that can be tested and, and make that list longer. How do you think that will benefit uh, public safety? Don? Uh, oh, Don or me? Go ahead, right, Go ahead. Go ahead, Vern. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, the, the elephant in the room, the elephant in the drone industry is, is, uh, is Chinese made uh, drone company and they dominate, uh, you know, uh, worldwide sales, you know, upwards of 70 to 75 percent by by most estimates, and um, I think having a U.S. presence, uh, this is this is cutting edge uh, aviation industry, right? And so it's very important to have U.S. manufacturing, a U.S. presence uh, with regard to drones, and that's not to denigrate the the the, the company that really built the current drone uh, ecosystem, right? Made it popularized and standardized. They they build amazing drones. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, we do support, uh, you know, a wide variety of drones in the marketplace and American made drones, American made technology, uh, American made or American ingenuity in developing these is, is really critical toward the future. So I think that that is, is a, a really good strategy to, to, to do that. Um, what I would say is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important that, you know, our U.S. based drones catch up to, to where, uh, some of the other drone technology is because there there is a bit of a gap still with regard to some of the sensors, flight time, weather capabilities, things like that. However, um, you know companies like Skydio, companies like Brink, which are really starting to gain traction in the market, show that we completely do have that capability. And if the if it's not this uh, generation of drone that's you know exactly on par, like uh, you know I'm very confident the next generation of drones. From these companies is, is going to be there because U.S. based manufacturing in the drone industry is really starting to take root, and it's important that we support it. Frankly, thanks, Vern. So, Don, how do you see it from a Brink perspective? How do you see this industry-wide uh, program with AUBSI uh, moving forward, and how will it impact Brink? Yeah, and I and I, you know, echo what what Vern was was saying. I, I look at it earlier. We were talking about public perception. Also, um, there when the community is unsure about the technology that you're using, whether from a privacy access aspect or from um, whether or not it is being live streamed back to China or, or some other things, we need to have that um, technology here in the United States that um, is what is utilized by first responders, right? Um, we at Brink um, are always working on having an NDAA compliant um, UAS model. Um, we, we truly believe that um, the U.S., you know, we, we do have a lot of catching up to do. Um, I believe we can get there fairly rapid, rapidly and um, create um, technology that first responders can use and trust on a day-to-day -day, um, basis, but also that the community will accept. Um, you, you mentioned the word China. Um, there's, there's immediate hesitation. Um, and especially when there, there comes funding um, to buy Chinese made products, um, there, there is a hesitation. So when, when um, first responders agencies can go to, the, to their community and say, this is what we wanna purchase. It is built in the United States. It's made, um, you know, it's vetted, it is trustworthy. Um, it's a lot easier to, to, to accept for the community. Thanks, Don. Now, now, Fritz, let me switch over to you because the five C's kind of hit on the cybersecurity piece. But what does this mean for Skydio as well? 
Well, I mean, data security is very important. I mean, we saw in the news today, I think Suffolk County had a hack where they can't even use their 911 system. So, um, you know, if you're an IT director, if you're um, someone responsible for the security of all the data in the city, um, you know, everything on that system is important to you. It's a uh, country of origin, uh, who controls the software, um, what, what security, um, are, what security measures are in place. Skydio today just announced that we're a SOC 2 type two certified. Um, so th we're taking daily steps to just continue to strengthen the security of our platform and the data security, because this is a very big, um, priority. Uh, certainly the, 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 the sensors of the drone, the flight time, all those little specs are important to the end users, and those are important. And Skydio is uh, addressing those and working great, making great products to address that. But it understands that there's more than just uh, the end user as a stakeholder, right? Again, you have the IT people who are in charge of all the all the in infrastructure information. You have the community that it serves. You have the people that own the data that ends up on these drones um, and is being used to uh, prosecute people, save people's lives, um, and you have uh, you know, so so it's it's a complete picture. I mean, a complete understanding of all the stakeholders, and it's developing and designing platforms that respect the values and the, the concerns of all the stakeholders. Thanks. So one of the things I want to I want to go back on as far as what Vern said earlier, it's important. And when we said, you know, we we shouldn't have all these segmented or divided or silos, as he put it. Uh, as far as drone programs. I just want to make sure that people understand that one of the things that was brought up in the first panel was, um, I wish I knew what I was getting into. What people need to realize is that if you start a drone program in your, in your, your locality and you're the only one that started a program, uh, be, uh, expect to be re requested to fly all the missions. So if you're fired, just don't think that you're going to fire only, fly only fire missions because very quickly it's going to see the value and you're going to be asked to fly other missions. Uh, and what's important to really understand about the training piece of this, one of the questions came up and said, how are first responders in the U.S. receiving training in drone operations? And it's kind of all over the board. And it's uh, there's really no standard that's set out there. I wanted to bring this up because it's important to understand that MITRE is going to be working with us and a number of you all are going to be working as far as advisory members on the panel to establish that fundamental uh, base training for both indoor and outdoor flight operations. But my, my main point here is, is don't get locked in to just going to law enforcement events or fire service events as far as drone conferences, because there's really a huge crossover and a lot to be learned by both organizations. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, I want to each ask each of the panelists now one more question, uh, and if you could just give me a brief answer to this: uh, Where do you see your company going uh, in the near future? What's what's on the the near horizon that's new? Uh, Fritz, I'll start with you. So um, obviously, DFR is a, a huge uh, use case that we all see the value in. So uh, Skydio is well aware of that. Adam Reese been thinking about dock drones for quite some time, as you know. And so really that next level of uh, a full suite of autonomy, uh, software driven product um, integrated with a dock system, full, being able to fly uh, remotely and at a moment's notice for a variety of use cases, public safety being the one we're all talking about, but it, it goes beyond that. So uh, certainly having a holistic approach to that in terms of not only the hardware, but the software, the regulations that might be needed, um, and really uh, walking into a turnkey uh, system that agencies that don't have the knowledge, don't wanna spend time being becoming experts in drones, but want the value of drones. That's really where uh, I think our future is and everybody in the industry realizes that on some level, um, that's the future is scaling these products um, with the, the value of autonomy and, and just having these things become more ubiquitous and less one-on-one, -on -one, uh, less a unique use case and more a daily use case. All right, Don. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Vern and Fritz and I have worked together for many, 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 many years and worked together on the DFR program. So a lot of our views are, are very similar. Um, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about kind of what is the future of UAS within uh, first responder um, kind of the response. And, you know, we talked about um, the idea that 
having a base station um, that is at each fire department because fire departments are geographically placed throughout a county and then maybe having the, these drones that are um, integrated into your CAD system. So you get a priority call and the dispatcher just hits a button and the closest drone immediately launches. And then you have somebody from a, from a distance, um, you know, drone as a first responder, being able to uh, take control of that drone and then live feed that information back for real-time intelligence to the first responders. That, that is, you know, Brink's <laughs> view also much, much like Skydio's. Um, and that we truly believe that the drone as a first responder can be um, really more autonomous, um, scale it down so you're not having to uh, pay for somebody on the rooftops, the, the pilots in command, that um, as the technology increases, the use of it becomes a lot easier. The regulations um, get a lot better. A lot of it is from, from your work and drone responders work um, to get in that DFR waiver that hopefully will come online pretty fairly quickly here for the two mile beyond visual line of sight, which makes it um, more scalable for all first responders to have a DFR program. And Brink definitely wants to be a part of that. Burn? Yeah, I think one of the, the phrases that I used really early on with drone as first responder and drone as ge in general is, you know, I want my cops to be cops, right? I don't want them to be pilots, right? The, having pilot skill sets is, is, is one aspect. Um, but I'd say it's the same with firefighters, right? You need your you need your first responders, your firefighters, your cops to use their highest level skill sets. And while we can use them as pilots, they can certainly be effective aviators and pilots. Is that really the highest best use for for, for folks? And so I, I um, you know echo uh, Fritz and Don like it, autonomy clearly is the future, and it and it might look like a variant of drone as a first responder. Um, we don't pretend that you know from our experience at Chula Vista like we built the perfect model. We built a model right uh, on which we can all build and and modify and, and make it. Uh, better in, in the future. But I think the key thing is that we're going to use technology for good um, and take the burden, uh, take the, that those piloting skills, put it more on the edge with the drone, uh, such as Skydio has been doing, such as Brink has been doing, and it, we at Axon building entire ecosystems to make it easier to pilot, take the burden off personnel, let, let uh, robotics and autonomy do the work um, and we just direct it or even just use AI where it, a lot of work might be standardized. Uh, we might have drone swarms set perimeters and do set tasks on a fire scene or on a, uh, on a police department scene or something in the future. So, uh, you know, really limitless uh, you know, in terms of what we can do according to our imagination. But clearly, um, I, I would say that the days of uh, us relying on a pilot with a controller in their hand uh, you know, doing the vast majority of missions, I think that's, that's fairly limited. I, I'd say in the next, you know, uh, you know, three, four, five, six years, that uh, it's going to be far more autonomous and in, in even just setting missions off your, your, your phone, to be frank. All right, well, I'm going to go through and hit some of the questions that were left over. Uh, one, uh, what is the opinion of using NIST lanes as a validation method for documenting U.S. pilot flying skills? And if if, if you all don't mind, I'll answer this question. I think NIST has created a standardized approach to, to measure some objective, objective ways to measure public, public safety remote pilot proficiency. It is a tool, it is not the tool. Uh, so it is one of the fundamental ways of seeing if people are getting that uh, through. Um, I have another question here. It says, my Colorado district has a tier one railroad with 12 to 24 trains per day. Are railroads adopting drones for overwatch? Uh, indeed they are. Uh, and some of the ways, and some of the railroads are some more advanced using beyond visual line of sight operations. Uh, so you need to check with your local your local railroad to see how they're using them because it's some of them are, some of them aren't. And this one I'll put out for all of you is a possible answer. What is the sensitivity of the latest drones to weather conditions? Uh, we're in somewhat mountainous terrain with altitudes between 6,500 to 8,500 feet. So let me just kind of go, Fritz, you want to talk about that at all or? Does it depend on the aircraft that you're looking at? Yeah, obviously it depends on the aircraft. It varies depending on um, what it's designed for, what you're going to use for. We obviously know anything that's uh, intended to be used by first responders out in the elements uh, has to be, um, you know, able to withstand those elements. Elements. So every new design, uh, that's a very key aspect in terms of uh, what goes into that design. The ruggedness, um, its ability to to fly in any condition, because obviously when the weather's nice, you have other assets. It's most important to know what's going on when the weather's bad. So 
definitely a priority. And the other part of that is, is when the weather's bad, uh, visibility is poor. So current regulations, we got to have, you know, be able to see uh, beyond visual line of sight, have an, ha have an airspace awareness uh, on that. And then for, I know for DFR, if it's really bad, poor weather, um, kind of the camera doesn't show what we want it to show. Um, so uh, in, in the interest of public safety, we always would ground our, our drones, even though they probably could withstand some of the weather conditions that were, were present at the time. Vern? Absolutely. You know, I think the key is is picking the, the right tool for each job, right? And a drone is nothing more than a tool. So you're just going to have to look at what your specific use case is going to be. The, the right tool for Chula Vista PD might not be the right tool for that agency that's uh, that's up with, uh, you know, more rugged environment. So definitely, uh, you know, some research with regard to that. I'm always happy to assist as, as Don and Fritz are as well with uh, our opinions on it. So feel free to reach out to us. And I'll, I'll end this with saying that uh, uh, MITRE is also working on a developmental tool that will help public safety be able to understand the capabilities of drones. So if you're looking through it, I'll kind of go through and prompt you to ask certain questions. And with that, I thank all of you all for being here as a member of the panels today and for all the work that you've done in the areas of public safety uh, uncrewed aircraft systems. So Thanks. it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Paul McDonough, who will be taking over from this point. He is with DHS, uh, First Responder Resiliency Portfolio. Uh, and uh, Paul, you and I are gonna have to talk some more um, to see some opportunities. He has 38 years of service with Seattle PD and is former Assistant Chief of Seattle's Homeland Security Bureau. Paul, take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And yes, we will have to talk. Um, I do wanna make a quick question because the way the screen is set up here, can everyone see the uh, slide deck right now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so first of all, I wanna say thanks to uh, Director Borsam and uh, Dr. King for letting me speak here today. Um, it's gonna be uh, a little slower than the conversations that you had earlier. You had some great conversations about UAVs and kind of where it's going and, and what's been going on with it. And I only have a little bit to add into that, but we wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, understand a little bit more about what DHS is doing in this realm, but also in the overall realm of first responders. So, which I heard that theme throughout the conversation here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to move the screen here. Although, there we go. Uh, this is just a quick little outline. And for the sake of time, I'll go through that little, little bit there. <clears throat> uh, our mission here is to maximize the preparedness and keep people safe in our communities by development of technologies and knowledge products. And I wanna stress knowledge products because we do a quite a bit of those uh, that address first responder needs through rapid prototyping, field testing and commercialization. And the reason we do that is as our first responders uh, tell us what their needs are and I'll explain how we get all that here in a second. Um, we wanna try to get that into the hands of the first responders as quickly as possible. And so, this is my comment on the bottom. We are the first line of defense for, uh, excuse me, keep getting pinged here from teams. Uh, first responders are the first line of defense for Homeland Security across the nation. And I firmly believe that and love the work we do. Obviously as a former first responder, I really appreciate the people out there. This is our customer base in the first responder uh, resource group. And I manage the first responder portfolio. Uh, obviously, you can see fires at the top there, but you can also see that it's multidiscipline by design. Again, um, our, 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 our private entities here were just saying it, hey, think about collaborating and working together with your fellow disciplines. That's critical. And uh, quite honestly, it's the only way that we're going to be able to do this effectively and efficiently. And so these are the different ones that we currently deal with in the portfolio and then sub branches off of those. So. You'll see that we have bomb technicians here uh, across the country. Bomb technicians can be police or fire. And uh, so we work with them. And another one that's not on here is canine detection. We've actually added that uh, to the portfolio. Our five key focus areas within the first responder portfolio, and obviously uh, UAVs are gonna fit in there and drones as a first responder under the first responder technologies. And then obviously we work with bomb squads. That's a, very pressing things, getting that information to the uh, state and locals. We work on personal protective equipment, we work on public safety communications, which I liked hearing that you wanted to be able to talk to the victims and or um, first responders in the field with your 
drones and then be able to send that information back. That's the information that would fall in our wheelhouse. And then the last one here is stakeholder engagement, how we reach out to the first responder community. And we're fortunate enough here today to have uh, Chief Roseberry uh, is actually a member of the first responder resource group, which I'm gonna talk about right now. And uh, if I say anything wrong, Chief, try to be gentle, but go ahead and correct me. Uh, we have a little over 160 uh, state and local responders as part of this group, and they cover all the disciplines that I just showed you earlier. Uh, the idea here is to bring them together and together, excuse me, and ask them, what are your current needs right now? What are you facing that you need something, either a knowledge product or I'll call it a widget for time, uh, some sort of equipment that would make your life safer, make it more efficient for you to work out in the communities that you serve. And uh, we do that, uh, the long and the short of it is uh, under federal law, you can't actually tell me what to do. But what we do is we solicit their input and then we sort through it and then we come back and say, hey, would it be worthwhile if we offered this solution or helped you try to develop this solution? And uh, so that's how we move it forward. Uh, 10 years, about three years, although with COVID, uh, we're given a bit of a breather because that was absolutely brutal to live through. Uh, we pull from all the regions of the United States, again, multidiscipline, multi-region, because as was mentioned earlier, some of the big cities can do some things that the smaller jurisdictions can't. Some of the more rural areas can do more than the urban areas can't. And we wanna get that nice blend of what the actual needs are for our first responders. Uh, last year, this is just an illustration and I'm going really fast for two reasons. One, uh, we had time constraints, which I know have been list lifted, but unfortunately my work has called and said, no, I need you here pretty quickly. So I'm gonna go quickly. Uh, health and safety for personal protective equipment. That's one of them. Emerging threats and technologies is one that uh, the UAVs fall under. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with um, UAVs uh, a little bit later. But uh, I will say that Charles Warner was one of the people that I was told to reach out to early on when I got this job. And so it's been a while, Charles, but it's good to hear your voice. Uh, crowd management was obviously very big in 2020. So it was on the minds of first responders. And everyone thinks I always talk about law enforcement with that. But the truth of the matter is the fire service and EMS uh, actually agreed with some of that. And one of the projects we're looking at right now is, um, and for the fire service, don't get sensitive, uh, uh, new fire helmets that actually add ballistic protection because of the environments that you're finding yourself in. And we want to add protection to that and still give you the coverage that you need for day-to-day -day services. So strategic command and control and communication and situational awareness also fit within the realm of the UAVs. And so We'll pass that on. Uh, one of the things that we do is we find out what's out on the market right now and what private industry is doing and private industry is here and give a very good overview and how they're really pushing the envelope. So uh, again, I wanna explain a little bit more of that uh, as I go through here, but we look for something that if there's an 80% solution to what the first responders are asking for or better, then we probably won't do anything. We may reach out to uh, the vendor and say, hey, would you consider adding a mounting clip for a sensor device or something like that if you're talking UAVs? Um, but for the most part, we let it go out. We do do what are called operational experiments and we use New Steel, the National Urban Security Technology Laboratory located in New York, but it represents um, the whole nation. And uh, we'll do uh, evaluations where first responders, I pay for first responders to come in and actually utilize the equipment and then give objective feedback. Now that feedback is given to the vendor, but it's also written up in a report that we share with uh, the first responder community through the SAVER program. And at the end of the slides, I'll show you how you can access some of that information. If it's less than a 50% solution, if it's out there, then we'll explore the possibility of figuring out how we can make that better. And if it's less than a 50% solution, but it's a priority for the first responders, then DHS may take it on as uh, a project themselves where we fund uh, a request uh, for solution development from the private sector. Everything we do, we go through the private sector. And uh, so they'll be able to come in and say, hey, we can build you or get you that and it'll cost this much. And then we determine if we can do it and uh, hopefully execute a contract to bring that to fruition. Uh, this is exactly the same thing. It just kind of outlines uh, the, the time frame a little bit better. And that is set up because, again, we want to get the product into the hands of the first responders immediately, saving their lives, which allows them to 
actually saved more lives. Lives, excuse me. Um, uh, this last line at the bottom here, this transitioning, DHS rarely buys the product. We have one product that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but for the most part, we push it back to the vendors uh, uh, or the private sector. Private sector normally retains intellectual property rights and they put it out there, even if we pay for the development. And so we put it out there and then uh, we hope that the first response community wants to pick it up. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about is a project not a lot of people heard about over the last couple of years. It's called Project Responder. And uh, Project Responder is um, where we do in fact do some, not as much as just the UAV area, but that's in there, is what's the future forecast? For the first responder community what's got their concerns right now and what do they think is going to happen as we go forward in the future and um, believe it or not it's been going on since 2004 this is project responder 6 it's just been released by dhs if you go to any one of the search engines you can type in dhs project responder 6 and it'll take you to a link it's web enabled so you can look at those things that are important to you so you don't have to read the whole document and this year it's a big document our first responders had quite a bit to say about um, kind of what they want to see as we go forward in the future. Um, as you'll see here, uh, when we publish this, it's not just to say, hey, we did something. Uh, it's actually utilized by the ac academia to determine where they may start doing some research or understanding or educational branches. Uh, obviously, private industry looks at it and says, oh, they're talking about this. We have a product that might fit within that realm. And, uh, and then obviously uh, international agencies. And it was nice to see Chief Lane here. Um, I work with uh, a group called the International Forum for the Advancement of First Responder Innovation. The acronym is IFAFRI. And uh, it's an international consortium of countries that are focused solely on first responder needs and making first responders uh, more efficient and effective at what they're doing day in and day out. Uh, Britain is in fact a member of that. I uh, work with a couple of good people over in your T&E labs over there. And uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do here with Project Responder. And what Project Responder has done in the past, right? Some of our successes, we did a online um, active shooter is what it was initially designed for, but it's actually grown into active shooter and emergency management and, and the school systems all getting online at the same time. This is a little bit, um, it's not halo. Uh, it's actually follows physical laws. Fire hoses can put water on, but if you don't spray it in the right spot, the fire won't go out. Police officers cannot run like a gazelle. They go as fast as a human can run. You have to engage with the target. But the real win on this one is the communication platform. If I'm on the police channel, I don't get to hear fire. So if I'm calling for EMS, it's not going to EMS until you flip to the right channel. And, it's a, it's a nice little training aid. Uh, it's called Edge. Again, you can find all of this uh, online at the DHS website. We're working on uh, identity credentialing and access management, which has been a bit of a thorn, thorn in people's side when people come in under mutual aid. And then uh, quite honestly, our most important one that the fire service is leading the charge on, but it's gonna be rolled over to our other disciplines is our project called Pointer, which is XYZ coordinates. And uh, we've got uh, test results back right now from phase one, and it's going to commercialization um, where we can get, um, it used to be about three meters, maybe a little bit more, where you could use uh, uh, other types of technology to track. Uh, this has gotten down to one centimeter, and that's absolutely amazing. So if you're on the 15th floor or fifth floor, we know you're on the fifth floor, not the fourth floor, or not laying down on the floor of the sixth floor. We know exactly where you're at. And that's, really promising and we're hoping that that one comes forward, but that came out of Project Responder and the First Responder Resource Group. Um, these slides are really more for those who might wanna look at this a little bit later. This is kind of the methodology that we use just to show you that we weren't trying to be one-sided. Um, we'll talk about some of the topic areas, but clearly protest uh, and civil unrest and then public health with the pandemic uh, were really on the first responders' minds. Uh, these are the objectives. Um, the first one here is the one that I think is, is probably the most important. Examine and ass assess the responders' environment and see what they have to say about what's going on, and then identify their capability and needs on top of that. 
Uh, with that, we'll uh, try to make sure that we prioritize it, use the scientific method there and access the impact. And all of this is into the report. This is some of the participation. You can see that 38% were fire, 33 for law. EMS made up 12, emergency management 10. And the other 8% are those that uh, probably public safety communications. Uh, we have some tech people in there for uh, some of that and uh, the bomb squads, et cetera, that also had their comments shared. And I hope I'm not going too fast, but I don't want to bore everybody. So five ranked very, very high, 49 uh, different areas were ranked as a high priority, and then 10 of them did crossover. So when you get to the document, you can take a look at it and uh, focus in on just the high needs. These are the ones, <clears throat> excuse me, that were identified. Uh, as you were saying earlier, the ability to incorporate real-time incident data into decision-making. Um, getting that information before you even get to the scene as was outlined, uh, earlier in the discussions, that's one of the things that we're hearing a lot and that the responders would really like to have a lot more. Ability to geolocate uh, responders in three dimensions is still the priority, which we're hoping pointer addresses. Uh, that's been a project that's been going on for a number of years. Ability to maintain communications uh, between units in difficult environments. And then the ability to maintain sufficient quality staff for leadership roles uh, during long duration or simultaneous events. One of the things that came out of this last forum was the fact that a lot of our experienced personnel are retiring and we need to have uh, a, for, a form in which to train them faster than the historical matter of bringing them in a little bit. And then from that, uh, immersive technologies, VR, AR, et cetera, as mentioned. And then here you'll see at the bottom, the ability to mitigate specific unmanned uh, UAESs in a set airspace. Uh, clearly, that's more on the security side than the situational awareness side, but um, I think if you watch international uh, news, you'll know that UAVs are becoming quite a problem for security issues. Uh, how and what do we transition? Um, it's not really well known, and I've only got a couple of them up here, but we've transitioned 23 technologies to the commercial market over the last seven years. Our red ops are our bomb squads. That's the bomb uh, teams from Fire or PD, they work with uh, the federal agencies, including the military, determine the best way to do it. They put out 70 knowledge reports and improved technology equipment uh, over the last couple of years. And it's absolutely amazing. So uh, Finder is a search and rescue tool, uh, finding people in the rubble pile, much like you heard about the drone flying in and listening for people. That's the same type of stuff. They redesigned the Shelby uh, or the firefighter structure glove to make it uh, more maneuverable, it lasts longer. It uh, lasts like twice, almost three times as long as other gloves at the time. And what you're seeing is a lot of uh, manufacturers are starting to copy what we did there. And that's our picture of them working the edge virtual tool. As you see them all sitting here, you could literally say, hey, I'll just tell you what's going on. But uh, you have your headsets on and what they try to do is set people up so that this is not two emergency managers sitting together saying, hey, we'll concoct this they're sitting away, so they actually have to use the communication platform. So. A couple other transitions are here. Uh, this is a law enforcement one up here on the right. Um, this HASS emergency vehicle alerting system has gone out and uh, some of the major manufacturers are starting to put it into the car so that when an emergency vehicle is on a code run coming up behind, we're trying to avoid accidents and clear the path. It lets them know that an emergency vehicle is coming and uh, can do that. You can also put it in another uh, first responder vehicle so we can stop red on red or blue on blue accidents. Um, we did some voice uh, technology and uh, analysis. And then the one, it should be in here. Oh, it's not in here. Um, we did uh, some firefighter, wildland firefighter uh, uniforms and wildland firefighter respirators, what we're working on right now. And we got a couple other uh, things in the works that I hope will do it. With that, I'm going to go ahead and just leave this slide up for a quick second, and uh, I'm going to talk about UAVs. Uh, we did, in fact, have a couple of capability needs that uh, first responders, being very progressive, asked about. One of them was the ability to use a UAV to go in and not only locate the down victim, but also recover the victim. And uh, we did some um, uh, tech scouting and technology level and found out that right now the UAVs, uh, they're just not capable of doing that right now. And in the short term, we're not gonna be able to fund it with my uh, 
limited funding funding source. But with that, uh, they did in fact modify that gap and are trying to work on a tool that will assist first responders uh, getting uh, patients out of unique environments, whether it's an urban area with tight crawl spaces or if it's in a rural area out in the woods or something like that. Um, we are at DHS. Uh, we were asked here to look at the counter uh, UAS. Clearly that falls under federal authorities to mitigate um, FCC rules and things like that. Uh, Charles was talking about the new laws coming through and working within the authorities. We have to make sure we do that. So uh, my component or my portfolio is not currently looking at that. But as uh, uh, things progress in the other components or the other areas that we might be able to share, once we get legal authority, then we will in fact be able to share that with you. So uh, with that, I think I'm going through fairly quickly, but uh, this is my contact information. And uh, if anyone has any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I will make a pitch <laughs> as was done earlier for the first responder resource group. If that interests you, um, then feel free to send us an email. We'll send you an application. Uh, it has to be an application because we approve it and make sure that you're okay. But at the same time, we have to balance. So it may be a year or two before you get on. I know I waited for a year or two before I was on it, before I got the job, uh, because we want to make sure that we don't go heavy on one discipline or heavy on one uh, area, say urban. So those are some of the things that we do consider. We do have a first responder webpage that's listed there for you to check any of the resources that I've mentioned here and other things. And then one of the best things that we have out there is uh, SAVER reports. And again, that's from New Steel, the urban laboratory. And uh, they will do assessments on technology and equipment that's out there. And they also produce knowledge products. So if you're looking at a common operating platform, as was mentioned earlier, and you want to know how they're going, they'll do a quick assessment and they publish that. It's kind of like the consumer reports for first responders. It's not just for police or fire, it's EMS, uh, communication platforms, pretty much anything that might help you if you're making acquisitions within your first response community. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over and uh, see if there's anything else. Thank you very much, Paul. Really appreciate it. That's terrific. Uh, I will uh, pause for a minute, see if we have any questions specific to your uh, presentation. Let me okay. just... Great. Thank you very much for your time. Really, really do appreciate it. I, I want to say uh, thank you to everybody who's attended. We have quite a few folks who, who have uh, uh, connected, dialed in live, and our expectation is that we will uh, do what we can to uh, post uh, this more publicly so we can let others uh, join in this uh, extended conversation. Um, very excited and honored to have uh, Congressman Michael Guest uh, kick this uh, this off. Um, that was a, a terrific insight into um, concerns about uh, foreign-made drones, and that's, an, I think, an issue that's going to continue on uh, for quite some time. Uh, appreciated um, uh, RBP for sponsoring this. Uh, Yasri Barsoom, thank you very much for your support uh, and for all of our guests uh, and panelists who have, uh, have joined us. I uh, appreciate, Brian Duro, you taking the time to um, uh, do a fantastic job uh, moderating a, a really informative panel uh, from our, our fire chiefs and others. So thank you very much for that. And uh, Chief uh, Charlie Warner, thank you so much, Charles, for your, uh, uh, your uh, expert moderation. Uh, I know you're no stranger to this uh, either. And so uh, appreciate uh, a really tremendously informative panel from our, our industry folks. And of course, uh, Paul, for your last presentation. Thank you all very much. And um, this concludes uh, our Fire Rescue Drone Summit. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation uh, as we uh, reach out to folks uh, around the country uh, and uh, around the world, really. So thanks very much.